And then the third area, which basically dives off from this, is about engineering itself and, and, and sort of like why it's messy and why it should be messy. This here is actually a, um, a, a data center um, which uh, is uh, doing the Olympics. Um, so the first thing kind of like I want to show you there is grain, grain of wood. So if you see that little fence there, you see that all the grains in the wood are sort of like moving this way. And you instantly know that that's right. If all the grains would have like ran like that, most of you would have thought like, that's a bit odd. If I bend the fence, it's probably going to break. Water will get in it. it. It doesn't feel right. And that sort of like that type of grain is actually also something you, you kind of like have in IT, and which is really useful to, to pick up in IT. But in IT, it will mostly sort of like not just about technical things, but about organization, about communication. So what you'll see is that a lot of languages and a lot of sort of like technology families, they sort of like have a certain grain. So if you take some of the, the, the lower level languages like Perl, like uh, Python, like C and so on, you see sort of like that they typically sort of like are, are quite complex, they're quite low level. They don't deal with business processes that well, but they typically deal with sort of like communication and, and, and lower technical uh, um, sort of like uh, uh, IP-based uh, protocols really well. And there's sort of like a whole ra range of other things which come with it, because very often they're sort of like very, the, the build systems are very advanced, they're very automated, a lot of the testing is very automated, um, there are a lot of tools around them. Whereas if you go to sort of like other technologies, like for example Angular or Bootstrap, which sort of like are very high in the browser, you find suddenly much bigger, much, much fluffier types of technologies, which actually aren't actually that well tested, where testing is actually very hard, where you actually sort of like have to yeah, make judgment calls like how good is it, and suddenly a lot of things become black and white. And it's really useful to sort of like get a feeling for those things because that actually helps you pick the right thing and also realize that at some point you're just basically beating a dead horse. It just you, you can't say whether this is right or wrong because you're like let's say for example so high up in the browser where things are so yeah messy that actually you think this code is all right, you think you can sort of like deploy it, but actually you're not quite sure, and that will help you, we'll see later, about sort of like making other trade-offs about like uh, wh where you stop with your testing and so on. It also means that the organization around it will be different. So some organizations, let's say for example like the European Space Agency, um, they will sort of like have a lot of automated tests of their sort of like low-level C code and everything else, but once they pass, actually engineers will get a lot of trust and basically can go live in production quite quite quickly because it's sort of like very well understood how the thing works. That's kind of like in the nature of those languages. You see, see, see the same thing, for example, sometimes with Java and banking industry. Whereas in other cases, you've, it's, for example, when it's more like towards the end user, when it's JavaScript on the browser, you see sort of like that there are like lots of gates and, and there's sort of like never an organizational point where you can say now it's approved, now it's right. You're sort of like hoping it's right. And it's important to sort of like keep that in mind because if you're sort of like as technology is trying to, uh, your boss asks you like, is this okay? You can't really answer that question. And it's sort of like more important to actually say like, I don't know, than actually sort of like give a, give a fake answer there. Because if you do, then the organization sort of like starts to react and, and you cause all sorts of, of miscommunications around that. And that's also what you see in open source. Open source, its grain often fits to those lower layers. It fits with Apache, it fits with Linux, these lower layers, and often not in the higher layers. And if it fits with the higher layers, it's not a community effort quite often. It's often an effort of one or two persons who kind of like have the sort of like have the, 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 the goods, but also the, 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 the sort of like, um, yeah, kind of like presentation to present their solution as being a really, really good one and sort of like pave over all these little messy bits and, and sort of like rally behind it. And, and sort of like one of the things you can do there, actually, if you sort of like try to, to separate those, actually to look on the web about how these communities, how the technology uh, deals with new people, with people asking questions. You ask a question yourself and just observe how different communities will answer differently. Very aggressive, very helpful, very flowery, very terse, very go look over there. And that often gives you an idea of like how that technology works and that often helps you to really sort of like, yeah, put that technology in the right place. A person, one of the first person who actually managed to do that is, is this lady here. And um, she sort of like did a, well, she, she probably did the first in a whole range of other areas. This is Margaret Hamilton. She was the lead engineer of the Apollo uh, spacecraft program. So basically, she was the lead engineer on the, on the board computer of the, uh, the spacecraft. Um, that pile of books there is actually the printout of all the software which was on the uh, Apollo. And um, one of the interesting things she did sort of like, the first thing she sort of like discovered there was that um, we're sort of like using a lot of abstractions in IT. We actually, in fact, we use abstractions all the time. 
So we say like, oh, well, um, I've got a file system here, and, uh, or I've got memory, and it's infinitely large. Uh, when I store something on disk and I read it back half a minute later, I get exactly the same thing back. And you sort of like assume that's always true. Um, what she actually realized that that isn't actually necessarily always true, because your hard disk can be full, um, your memory can actually be finite, um, and there are all sorts of other cases or something else may have written to the same file at the same time, and actually what you read back is what that other thing wrote. So there are all sorts of like problems about that. And really, sort of like what she did was an engineering task there. She actually was the first person who sort of like said, like, IT isn't about bits and bytes and about like being things. It's actually an engineering profession where you have to make trade-offs. So if you take the example sort of like of a, of a tap, um, Basically, you're trying to get, uh, you've got a tap in your factory, and you kind of like wanted to make water of exactly 43 degrees because you need it for some other process, let's say cleaning bottles or making plastic. So you make a nice little software system around it, which sort of like measures the, the water temperature, and depending on the temperature, you open the, the, the hot or cold valve a little bit, and, and, and out comes nice 43 degrees Celsius. When you're done with that as an IT engineer, you say like, okay, great, I've got 43 degrees always, and I forget everything which is behind it. And then you sort of like start building the rest of your factory. Above it, you build layer after layer. So you connect to the bottle machine, the bottle cleaning machine, and ultimately all this works. What you find if you do it this way is that very quickly, um, actually, uh, things probably start to stutter. You get little oscillations. The water is not always the right. There's something wrong. And that's usually because actually, that water which comes out, of course, isn't always 43 degrees. When, when the tap has just opened, it may be a little bit colder. When you suddenly ask for a lot of water, it may be a little bit different. So what you do in engineering is actually very normal. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, we have that all the time. No problem. We put a big buffer in between, a big vat, um, and we fill the vat, and we just use the water from the bottom, and then it will always be more or less the same temperature. Done with it. And that's actually what she introduced in the Apollo engineering. Because what she actually realized, and actually a lot of the TOGAF principles we have today in architecture come from, from that era, is that actually the computer is not just a computer. It's actually the astronaut and the computer. So it's actually the whole thing. And astronauts sort of like make the, the code may not just fail, it may not have bug, it also makes so like the whole environment is failing. So basically, so, so like started thinking in all sorts of failure modes um, and so thinking of env en op op operating envelopes and sort of like where to track them, uh, trap them, and so like and how to track them. So, so interestingly enough, sort of like a lot of it is actually, is, is actually quite agile. And even if you go back to books from that era, sort of like the, the Medical Man months, if you haven't read the book, I, I encourage you to read it after your first failed project. Um, Basically, that book was written 40 years ago, and if you read it today, it reads exactly like the Agile Manifesto, which you can sort of like, which was only written five years ago. And a lot of that sort of like is about those leaking abstractions, sort of like having these these, these turnarounds uh, proper. The other thing, sort of like she sort of like said, like you, that you really want to isolate things. So isolation is something we've been doing in IT forever. So first we had like basically embedded CPUs, and then at some point we got things like Unix and Timeshare and mainframes. So we sort of like had process separation. And then after a while, we kind of like, um, yeah, programs started to share things like libraries. And we said like, oh, mm -hmm, let's kind of like have shared libraries. And then we got shared libraries. And then we said, oh, well, now we've got a dependency problem. And, 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 and we kind of like now have to sort of like isolate the various programs with their own libraries. So we sort of like put another layer of isolation around it. And at some point, we sort of like went to things like VMware. And then we went to Docker. And we sort of like layered after layer after layer. So in effect, sort of like that is something we, we do all the time. And usually when we've isolated something, just like with the abstraction, we think like, great, we're done. It's now isolated, it's now contained, it's no longer a problem. But interestingly enough, if you think about these isolated things also like which, which are interacting, even very, very simple little programs which are like isolated and dependent can still interact. So if you think of, for example, like Con Conway's Game of Life, or you think of, for example, like a Mandel Mandelbrot fractal, like a little simple calculation, together they can actually turn like produce very interesting, very beautiful sometimes patterns. And that's exactly what happens a lot in the industry when we isolate things and then sort of like put them all together. They actually start to have that type of sort of like almost organic or actually sometimes quite organic uh, behavior. That was something actually which it, at, the, at the BBC, at the British Broadcasting Corporation during the run-up to the Olympics was a serious challenge. How could we sort of like isolate the front end of the website enough so that all those things wouldn't sort of like start to interact with each other? And it turns out that it's as much sort of like as a technical software engineering effort as an organizational one because you sort of like want the organization to actually understand that isolation isn't perfect and that they actually need to do other things as well to sort of like make that whole thing happen. Another man who understood that really well was basically John Postel. And he actually looked at it a little bit differently. He said, like, well, actually, when you have all these software programs, when you actually connect them all together, you usually do that with an API or with some other uh, yeah, type of connector. And typically, when you write it, both sides are are well connected and it's very clear on both sides what you're doing. There's never a problem. Of course, in reality, change is inevitable. You find a bug on one side of your API, on one side of your connector, or you find an issue on the other, or you want to add a new feature. So actually, 
you have to sort of like change, you have to evolve that piece of software. And that means sort of like, yeah, you've got to coordinate that because now all your software has to sort of like change yeah, across the board essentially. So there's sort of like a lot of like coordination costs. There's a lot of communication costs in the organization of, of getting that done. And communication sort of like has a horizon. You can't sort of like shout, not every developer in the organization can shout to absolutely everyone in the organization about all their changes because that would just basically be a, a large amount of noise. And if there's actually one thing you sort of like can pick up from open source communities by participating in it, is actually sort of like how to communicate in these types of settings in a very safe way, which doesn't sort of like get you fired um, um, when you do it. So I encourage you to, to actually experiment with that. But so like that's a collaboration cost. And what John Postella actually said was sort of like, well, actually, we can solve this by being very conservative in what you do. So being very careful about that what you are sending out is correctly structured, correctly formatted, doesn't have any errors in it, and be as accommodating as possible for all the stuff you're receiving. And this actually became pretty much the motto of the Apache Software Foundation, of, the, of all the Apache source code. And this probably became the reason that sort of like the HTTP protocol, at the expense of all the other protocols at that time, like Z3950 and so on, actually became one of the most dominant ones. Likewise for HTML, pretty much likewise for XML. So pretty much all of the technologies sort of like which underpin the in internet have this infused in them. That you don't try to sort of like in your API kind of like force it upon someone else. You're trying to be as correct as possible yourself and you accept any old crap from everyone else and you try to do your best or you sort of simply say like, well, sorry, I can't do it anymore. So that's sort of like a very sort of like useful thing which, which, which effectively works and sort of like, yeah, helps reduce the cost of the overall assemble. And actually, if you get this one right, then all of a sudden scaling becomes actually doable. It becomes actually affordable. So if you isolate your things well, if you are very careful about your communications out and you actually accept a lot of cruft in, and you're very careful about sort of like about leaky abstraction and you understand that abstractions aren't perfect, your memory can fill up, you can have a bug, you sort of like distrust them a little bit. The next taken together, sort of like all of a sudden, you can actually start scaling things. And what you then see is that scaling isn't necessarily technical scaling, like adding more servers, adding more memory or whatever else. It's usually organizational scaling. It's usually sort of like allowing more teams to work on the same problem or allowing your sort of like to divide your problem in smaller parts and sort of like work on these parts individually. So that's often sort of like also not just like coping with a flash card, coping with a sudden in, uh, surge of traffic. It also means that all of a sudden, instead of like rolling out three or five or ten features a month, you can suddenly roll out three or five or ten features a day. So a lot of these things sort of like then to basically come together and become, yeah, essentially uh, an architecture, um, uh, sort of like a good sort of like set of design principles. And this is actually one of the things you can pick up in a lot of open source projects when you collaborate there. You can sort of like pick up those principles because as soon as you get a, a group of like 20, 30, 40 developers working together, it's these things which sort of like hold them together. So that's why it's actually quite valuable to um, not just sort of like experiment on GitHub, but actually experiment in a larger community of other developers, because you will actually sort of like learn a lot of the other developers and sort of like see sort of like that you're actually building something which is bigger than yourself. You're effectively getting a lever. You can also sort of like do this, go too far with this. Um, uh, there's a guy called Jamie Javinsky. He wrote the first uh, web browser. And he had this saying, which uh, is very dated. He said, like, every editor, so every editor you use for editing your program, at that time it was, of course, VI or Emacs, every editor grows until it can read email or it is replaced. And, and these days we can't quite relate to that anymore but because, of course, these days it will be like every, like, IDE you work in would sort of, like, grow until it can do Twitter and Facebook. But, but there is sort of, like, a certain level of truth in that it's sort of, like, when you have an hammer, everything looks like a nail. So when you're sort of like working in your team and you're, like you're building all those layers, it's incredibly tempting to kind of like go like, well, actually, I can do it in my layer. Forget the layer below me, forget the layer above me, I'll just do it everything here, it's just easier, much quicker, I can do it myself. So for example, let's say you, you're getting a request coming in from above about storing something securely and packaging it. You sort of like don't rely on the layers below you to do that right and get the locking right, you just do it yourself. And you sort of like put that functionality in there. And it's not just sort of like you who want to do that, it's actually also like, there are a lot of like commercial reasons quite often why it's also convenient. You don't have to communicate with other people, um, you don't have to work with other people. Uh, uh, perhaps if you're a company, you can extend a certain level of tax or you can sort of like extract rent from people going through your layer. So very often you see sort of like specific layers in, 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 the, in the architecture sort of like naturally growing until they sort of like fill that whole place. And one of the big deals there is that actually that means that suddenly you now have a layer in your architecture which you have to trust a lot. And 
that layer, because it's so trusted, it can extract rent. It can actually sort of like take shortcuts, but there's nothing you can do about it. So what you sort of like see is that you're gradually sort of like getting locked into a pattern, which is actually quite, quite unhealthy. And this is like another area where, where some companies are very cleverly using open source and open standard software, specifically open source software, because by introducing this into their, uh, into their software stacks, they prevent um, the uh, they prevent sort of like their whole software stacks to become too focused on one layer or to become too locked down. They sort of like keep sort of like it open, keep keep it sort of like wide enough. So and finally, sort of like um, there's also kind of like a co cost to having sort of like dirty architecture, but also like a cost of of, of having having <coughs> having your architecture being very clean. So all of these things are about compromise. All of these things are about like shortcuts and workarounds, and it's really easy to sort of like fall in a situation where you're trying to make something absolutely perfect, but then it just takes forever to finish, and you sort of like you never get there. It's also really easy to sort of like do something agile in little little pieces and pieces and pieces and pieces until you've got a machine like you have there on the on the on the on, on, on the right, which is sort of like yeah, just basically blemishes and nothing quite fits together. So a lot of the things sort of like you you need to learn, you need to find out very early in your career, sort of like how you make the trade-off between those things. Do you sort of like limit your scope? Do you strive for a compromise? Do you sort of like uh, um, yeah f find a few sort of like uh, useful uh, um, yeah principles about like well actually let's be careful with abstractions, let's isolate this. So how you sort of like yeah deal with that? Because effectively, as soon as your architecture entirely clean, you probably have a problem because it's completely stagnated. And if it's incredibly dirty, you've got a problem because it's probably so full full of fort shortcuts that that doesn't work either. So that's kind of like basically what we learned at, at, in, in Apache, that effectively when you're sort of like starting to do that to an existing piece of technology, you're really sort of like firstly fixing an organizational problem, like finding a collaboration, uh, a way of collaborating with each other, and actually sort of like finding the right grain to do that together. So effectively make sure that the things you all want to do are actually easy because the technology makes it easy, the build systems make it easy, the test systems make it easy, and so on. Um, and also, sort of like where, where necessary, sort of like where we sort of like yeah are able to 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 basically contain the abstractions or sort of like at least sort of like so we don't have to think about that. And sort of like gradually, sort of like that that whole sort of like duct tape thing become become ultimately sort of like not so just duct tape anymore. It's sort of like more a purveyor of duct tape, sort of like more a, a machine that, that that makes duct tape. So that's it for me for now. <laughs>